Section 13 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic First Division Transcendental Analytic Book 2 Transcendental Doctrine of the Faculty of Judgment or Analytic of Principles Chapter 2 System of All Principles of the Pure Understanding Section 3 Systematic Representations of All Synthetical Principles of the Pure Understanding 1. Axioms of Intuition 2. Anticipations of Perception 3. Analogies of Experience First Analogy Principle of the Permanence of Substance that principles exist at all is to be ascribed solely to the pure understanding which is not only the faculty of rules in regard to that which happens but is even the source of principles according to which everything that can be presented to us as an object is necessarily subject to rules because without such rules we never could attain to cognition of an object. Even the laws of nature, if they are contemplated as principles of the empirical use of the understanding, possess also a characteristic of necessity, and we may therefore at least expect them to be determined upon grounds which are valid a priori and antecedent to all experience. But all laws of nature without distinction are subject to higher principles of the understanding, inasmuch as the former are merely applications of the latter to particular cases of experience. These higher principles alone therefore give the conception which contains the necessary condition and as it were the exponent of a rule experience on the other hand gives the case which comes under the rule there is no danger of our mistaking merely empirical principles for principles of the pure understanding or conversely for the character of necessity according to conceptions which distinguish the latter and the absence of this in every empirical proposition how extensively valid soever it may be is a perfect safeguard against confounding them there are however pure principles a priori which nevertheless i should not ascribe to the pure understanding for this reason that they are not derived from pure conceptions but although by the mediation of the understanding from pure intuitions but understanding is the faculty of conceptions such principles mathematical science possesses but their application to the experience consequently their objective validity nay the possibility of such a priori synthetical cognitions the deduction thereof rests entirely upon the pure understanding on this account i shall not reckon among my principles those of mathematics though i shall include those upon the possibility and objective validity a priori of principles of the mathematical science which consequently are to be looked upon as the principle of these and which proceed from conceptions to intuition and not from intuition to conceptions in the application of the pure conceptions of the understanding to possible experience the employment of their synthesis is either mathematical or dynamical, 
for it is directed partly on the intuition alone, partly on the existence of phenomenon. But the a priori conditions of intuition are in relation to a possible experience absolutely necessary. Those of the existence of objects of a possible empirical intuition are in themselves contingent. Hence, the principles of the mathematical use of the categories will possess a character of absolute necessity, that is, will be apodictic. Those, on the other hand, of the dynamical use, the character of an a priori necessity indeed, but only under the condition of empirical thought in an experience therefore only mediately and indirectly. Consequently, they will not possess that immediate evidence which is peculiar to the former, although their application to experience does not, for that reason, lose its truth and certitude. But of this point we shall be better able to judge at the conclusion of this system of principles. The table of categories is naturally our guide to the table of principles, because these are nothing else than rules for the objective employment of the former. Accordingly, all principles of the pure understanding are 1. Axioms of intuition 2. 3. Anticipations, analogies of perception of experience 4. Postulates of empirical thought in general These appellations I have chosen advisedly in order that we might not lose sight of the distinctions in respect of the evidence and the employment of these principles. It will, however, soon appear that a fact which concerns both the evidence of these principles and the a priori determination of phenomena, according to the categories of quantity and quality, if we attend merely to the form of these. The principles of these categories are distinguishable from those of the two others, inasmuch as the former are possessed of an intuitive, but the latter of a merely discursive, though in both instances a complete certitude. I shall therefore call the former mathematical, and the latter dynamical principles footnote twenty nine to follow it must be observed however that by these terms i mean that just as little in the one case the principles of mathematics as those of general physical dynamics in the other i have here in view merely the principles of the pure understanding in their application to the internal sense, without distinction of the representations given therein, by means of which the sciences of mathematics and dynamics become possible. Accordingly, I have named these principles rather with reference to their application than their content and I shall now proceed to consider them in the order in which they stand in the table. Footnote 29. All combination, conjunctio, is either composition, compositio, or connection, nexus. The former is the synthesis of a manifold, the parts of which do not necessarily belong to each other. For example, the two triangles in which a square is divided by a diagonal do not necessarily belong to each other, 
and of this kind is the synthesis of the homogeneous in everything that can be mathematically considered. This synthesis can be divided into those of aggregation and coalition, the former of which is applied to extensive, the latter to intensive quantities. The second sort of combination, nexus, is the synthesis of a manifold, in so far as its parts do belong necessarily to each other. For example, the accident to a substance or the effect to the cause. Consequently, it is a synthesis of that which, though heterogeneous, is represented as connected a priori. This combination, not an arbitrary one, I entitle dynamical because it concerns the connection of the existence of the manifold. This again may be divided into the physical synthesis of the phenomena divided among each other, and the metaphysical synthesis, or the connection of phenomena a priori in the faculty of cognition. 1. Axioms of intuition. The principle of these is, all intuitions are extensive quantities. Proof. All phenomena contain, as regards their form, an intuition in space and time, which lies a priori at the foundation of all without exception. Phenomena, therefore, cannot be apprehended, that is, received into empirical consciousness, otherwise than through the synthesis of a manifold, through which the representations of a determinate space or time are generated, that is to say, through the composition of the homogeneous and the consciousness of the synthetical unity of this manifold, homogeneous. Now, the consciousness of a homogeneous manifold in intuition, in so far as thereby the representation of an object is rendered possible, is the conception of a quantity, quanti. Consequently, even the perception of an object as phenomenon is possible only through the same synthetical unity of the manifold of the given sensuous intuition, through which the unity of the composition of the homogeneous manifold in the conception of a quantity is cogitated. That is to say, all phenomena are quantities and extensive quantities because, as intuitions in space or time, they must be represented by means of the same synthesis through which space and time themselves are determined. An extensive quantity I call that wherein the representation of the parts renders possible and therefore necessarily antecedes the representation of the whole. I cannot represent to myself any line, however small, without drawing it in thought, that is, without generating from a point all its parts one after another and in this way alone producing this intuition. Precisely the same is the case with every, even the smallest portion of time. I cogitate therein only the successive progress from one moment to another, and hence, by means of the different portions of time and the addition of them, a determinate quantity of time is produced. As the pure intuition in all phenomena 
is either time or space, so is every phenomenon in its character of intuition an extensive quantity inasmuch as it can only be cognized in our apprehension by successive synthesis from part to part all phenomena are accordingly to be considered as aggregates that is as a collection of previously given parts which is not the case with every sort of quantities but only those which are represented and apprehended by us as extensive on this successive synthesis of the productive imagination in the generation of figures is founded the mathematics of extension or geometry with its axioms which express the conditions of sensuous intuition a priori under which alone the schema of a pure conception of external intuition can exist for example quote, between two points only one straight line is possible end quote. Quote, two straight lines cannot enclose a space end quote, etc these are the axioms which properly relate only to quantities quanta as such but as regards the quantity of a thing quantitas that is to say the answer to the question quote, how large is this or that object end quote. although in respect to this question we have various propositions synthetical and immediately certain in demonstra belia we have in the proper sense of the term no axioms for example the proposition quote, if equals be added to equals the wholes are equal end quote. Quote, if equals be taken from equals the remainders are equal end quote. are analytical because i am immediately conscious of the identity of the production of the one quantity with the production of the other whereas axioms must be a priori synthetical propositions on the other hand the self-evident propositions as to the relation of numbers are certainly synthetical but not universal like those of geometry and for this reason cannot be called axioms but numerical formulae that seven plus five equals twelve is not an analytical proposition for neither in the representation of seven nor of five nor of the composition of the two numbers do i cogitate the number twelve whether i cogitate the number in the addition of both is not at present the question for in the case of an analytical proposition the only point is whether i really cogitate the predicate in the representation of the subject but although the proposition is synthetical it is nevertheless only a singular proposition in so far as regard is here had merely to the synthesis of the homogeneous the units it cannot take place except in one manner although our use of the numbers is afterwards general if i say quote, a triangle can be constructed with three lines any two of which taken together are greater than the third End quote. i exercise merely the pure function of the productive imagination which may draw the lines longer or shorter and construct the angles at its pleasure on the contrary the number seven 
is possible only in one manner, and so is likewise the number twelve, which results from the synthesis of seven and five. Such propositions, then, cannot be termed axioms, for in that case we should have an infinity of these, but numerical formulae. The transcendental principle of the mathematics of phenomena greatly enlarges our a priori cognition, for it is by this principle alone that pure mathematics is rendered applicable in all its precision to objects of experience, and without it the validity of this application would not be so self-evident. On the contrary, contradictions and confusions have often arisen on this very point phenomena are not things in themselves empirical intuition is possible only through pure intuition of space and time consequently what geometry affirms of the latter is indisputably valid of the former all evasions such as the statement that objects of sense do not conform to the rules of construction in space for example to the rule of the infinite divisibility of lines or angles must fall to the ground for if these objections hold good we deny to space and with it to all mathematics objective validity and no longer know wherefore and how far mathematics can be applied to phenomena the synthesis of spaces and times as the essential form of all intuition is that which renders possible the apprehension of a phenomenon and therefore every external experience Consequently, all cognition of the objects of experience, and whatever mathematics in its pure use proves of the former, must necessarily hold good of the latter. All objections are but the chicaneries of an ill-constructed reason, which erroneously thinks to liberate the objects of sense from the formal conditions of our sensibility, and represents these, although mere phenomena, as things in themselves, presented as such to our understanding. But in this case, no a priori synthetical cognition of them could be possible. Consequently, not through pure conceptions of space and the science which determines these conceptions, that is to say, geometry would itself be impossible. 2. Anticipations of Perception the principle of these is, in all phenomena, the real, that which is an object of sensation, has intensive quantity, that is, has a degree. Proof Perception is empirical consciousness, that is to say, a consciousness which contains an element of sensation. Phenomena as objects of perception are not pure, that is, merely formal intuitions, like space and time, for they cannot be perceived in themselves. They contain then, over and above the intuition, the materials for an object through which is represented something existing in space or time. That is to say, they contain the real of sensation, as a representation merely subjective, which gives us merely the consciousness that the subject is affected, 
and which we refer to some external object. Now a gradual transition from empirical consciousness to pure consciousness is possible, inasmuch as the real in this consciousness entirely vanishes, and there remains a merely formal consciousness a priori of the manifold in time and space. Consequently, there is possible a synthesis also of the production of the quantity of a sensation from its commencement. That is, from the pure intuition equals zero, onwards up to a certain quantity of the sensation. Now, as sensation in itself is not an objective representation, and in it is to be found neither the intuition of space nor of time, it cannot possess any extensive quantity, and yet there does belong to it a quantity and that by means of its apprehension, in which empirical consciousness can within a certain time rise from nothing equals zero up to its given amount, consequently an intensive quantity. And thus we must ascribe intensive quantity, that is, a degree of influence on sense, to all objects of perception, in so far as this perception contains sensation. All cognition by means of which I am enabled to cognize and determine a priori what belongs to empirical cognition may be called an anticipation and without doubt this is the sense in which Epicurus employed his expression frolepsis. But as there is in phenomena something which is never cognized a priori, which on this account constitutes the proper difference between pure and empirical cognition, that is to say, sensation, as the matter of perception. It follows that sensation is just that element in cognition which cannot be at all anticipated. On the other hand, we might very well term the pure determinations in space and time, as well in regard to figure as to quantity, anticipations of phenomena because they represent a priori that which may always be given a posteriori in experience. But suppose that in every sensation, as sensation in general, without any particular sensation being thought of, there existed something which could be cognized a priori, this would deserve to be called anticipation in a special sense, special because it may seem surprising to forestall experience in that which concerns the matter of experience, and which we can only derive from itself. Yet such really is the case here. Apprehension by means of sensation alone fills only one moment, that is, if I do not take into consideration a succession of many sensations, as that in the phenomenon, the apprehension of which is not a successive synthesis advancing from parts to an entire representation. Sensation has therefore no extensive quantity, the want of sensation in a moment of time would represent it as empty, consequently equals zero. That which in the empirical intuition corresponds to sensation is reality, realitas, phenomenon. 
that which corresponds to the absence of it, negation equals zero. Now every sensation is capable of diminution, so that it can decrease and thus gradually disappear. Therefore, between reality in a phenomenon and negation, there exists a continuous concatenation of many possible intermediate sensations, the difference of which, from each other, is always smaller than that between the given sensation and zero, or complete negation. That is to say, the real in a phenomenon has always a quantity, which, however, is not discoverable in apprehension, inasmuch as apprehension take place by means of mere sensation in one instant, and not by the successive synthesis of many sensations, and therefore does not progress from parts to the whole. Consequently, it has a quantity, but not an extensive quantity. Now that quantity, which is apprehended only as unity, and in which plurality can be represented only by approximation to negation, equals zero. I term intensive quantity. Consequently, reality in a phenomenon has intensive quantity, that is, a degree. If we consider this reality as cause, be it of a sensation or of another reality in the phenomenon, for example, a change. We call the degree of reality in its character of cause a momentum. For example, the momentum of weight. For this reason that the degree only indicates that quantity, the apprehension of which is not successive, but instantaneous. This, however, I touch upon only in passing, for with causality I have at present nothing to do. Accordingly, every sensation, consequently every reality in phenomena, however small it may be, has a degree, that is, an intensive quantity, which may always be lessened, and between reality and negation there exists a continuous connection of possible realities and possible smaller perceptions. Every color, for example, red, has a degree, which, be it ever so small, is never the smallest, and so it is always with heat, the momentum of weight, etc. This property of quantities, according to which no part of them is the smallest possible, no part simple, is called their continuity. Space and time are quanta continua, because no part of them can be given without enclosing it within boundaries, points, and moments. Consequently, this given part is itself a space or a time. Space, therefore, consists only of spaces, and time only of times. Points and moments are only boundaries, that is, the mere places or positions of their limitation. But places always presuppose intuitions which are to limit or determine them, and we cannot conceive either space or time composed of constituent parts which are given before space or time. Such quantities may also be called flowing because synthesis of the productive imagination in the production of these quantities is a progression in time, the continuity of which we are accustomed 
to indicate by the expression flowing. All phenomena, then, are continuous quantities in respect both to intuition and mere perception, sensation and with it reality. In the former case they are extensive quantities, in the latter intensive. When the synthesis of the manifold of a phenomenon is interrupted, there results merely an aggregate of several phenomena, and not properly a phenomenon as a quantity, which is not produced by the mere continuation of the productive synthesis of a certain kind, but by the repetition of a synthesis always ceasing. For example, if I call thirteen dollars a sum or quantity of money, I employ the term quite correctly, inasmuch as I understand by thirteen dollars the value of a mark in standard silver, which is to be sure a continuous quantity, in which no part is the smallest, but every part might constitute a piece of money which would contain material for still smaller pieces. If, however, by the words thirteen dollars, I understand so many coins, be their value in silver what it may, I would be quite erroneous to use the expression a quantity of dollars. On the contrary, I must call them aggregate, that is, a number of coins and as in every number we must have unity as the foundation, so a phenomenon taken as a unity is a quantity, and as such always a continuous quantity, quantum continuum. Now seeing all phenomena, whether considered as extensive or intensive, are continuous quantities, the proposition, quote, all change, transition of a thing from one state into another, is continuous, end quote, might be proved here easily, and with mathematical evidence, were it not that the causality of a change lies entirely beyond the bounds of a transcendental philosophy and presupposes empirical principles. For of the possibility of a cause which changes the condition of things, that is, which determines them to the contrary to a certain given state, the understanding gives us a priori no knowledge. Not merely because it has no insight into the possibility of it, for such insight is absent in several a priori cognitions, but because the notion of change concerns only certain determinations of phenomena, which experience alone can acquaint us with, while their cause lies in the unchangeable. But seeing that we have nothing which we could here employ but the pure fundamental conceptions of all possible experience, among which, of course, nothing empirical can be admitted. We dare not, without injuring the unity of our system, anticipate general physical science, which is built upon certain fundamental experiences. Nevertheless, we are in no want of proofs of the great influence which the principle above developed exercises in the anticipation of perceptions, and even in supplying the want of them, so far as to shield us against the false conclusions which otherwise we might rashly draw. If all reality in perception has a degree, 
between which and negation there is an endless sequence of ever smaller degrees, and if, nevertheless, every sense must have a determinate degree of receptivity for sensations, no perception and consequently no experience is possible which can prove either immediately or mediately an entire absence of all reality in a phenomenon in other words it is impossible ever to draw from experience a proof of the existence of empty space or of empty time for in the first place an entire absence of reality in a sensuous intuition cannot of course be an object of perception secondly such absence cannot be deduced from the contemplation of any single phenomenon and the difference of the degrees in its reality nor ought it ever to be admitted in explanation of any phenomenon for if even the complete intuition of a determinate space or time is thoroughly real that is if no part thereof is empty yet because every reality has its degree which with the extensive quantity of the phenomenon unchanged can diminish through endless gradations down to nothing the void there must be infinitely graduated degrees with which space or time is filled and the intensive quantity in different phenomena may be smaller or greater although the extensive quantity of the intuition remains equal and unaltered we shall give an example of this almost all natural philosophers remarking a great difference in the quantity of the matter of different kinds of bodies with the same volume partly on account of the momentum of gravity or weight partly on account of the momentum of resistance to other bodies in motion conclude unanimously that this volume extensive quantity of the phenomenon must be void in all bodies although in different proportion but who would suspect that these for the most part mathematical and mechanical inquirers into nature should ground their conclusion solely on a metaphysical hypothesis a sort of hypothesis which they profess to disparage and avoid yet this they do in assuming that the real in space i must not here call it impenetrability or weight because these are empirical conceptions is always identical and can only be distinguished according to its extensive quantity that is multiplicity now to this presupposition for which they can have no ground in experience and which consequently is merely metaphysical i oppose a transcendental demonstration which it is true will not explain the difference in the filling up of spaces but which nevertheless completely does away with the supposed necessity of the above-mentioned presupposition that we cannot explain the said difference otherwise than by the hypothesis of empty spaces this demonstration moreover has the merit of setting the understanding at liberty to conceive this distinction in a different manner if the explanation of the fact requires any such hypothesis for we perceive that although two equal spaces may be completely filled by matters altogether different so that in neither of them is there left a single point 
wherein matter is not present nevertheless every reality has its degree of resistance or of weight which without diminution of the extensive quantity can become less and less ad infinitum before it passes into nothingness and disappears thus an expansion which fills a space for example caloric or any other reality in the phenomenal world can decrease in its degrees to infinity yet without leaving the smallest part of the space empty on the contrary filling it with those lesser degrees as completely as another phenomenon could with greater my intention here is by no means to maintain that this is really the case with the difference of matters in regard to their specific gravity i wish only to prove from a principle of the pure understanding that the nature of our perceptions makes such a mode of explanation possible and that it is erroneous to regard the real in a phenomenon as equal quod its degree and different only quod its aggregation and extensive quantity and this too on the pretended authority of an a priori principle of the understanding nevertheless this principle of the anticipation of perception must somewhat startle an inquirer whom initiation into transcendental philosophy has rendered cautious we must naturally entertain some doubt whether or not the understanding can enounce any such synthetical proposition as that respecting the degree of all reality in phenomena and consequently the possibility of the internal difference of sensation itself abstraction being made of its empirical quantity thus it is a question not unworthy of solution Quote, how the understanding can pronounce synthetically and a priori respecting phenomena and thus anticipate these even in that which is peculiarly and merely empirical that namely which concerns sensation itself the quality of sensation is in all cases merely empirical and cannot be represented a priori for example colors taste etc but the real that which corresponds to sensation in opposition to negation equals zero only represents something the conception of which in itself contains a being ein sein and signifies nothing but the synthesis in an empirical consciousness that is to say the empirical consciousness in the internal sense can be raised from zero to every higher degree so that the very same extensive quantity of intuition and illuminated surface for example excites as great a sensation as an aggregate of many other surfaces less illuminated we can therefore make complete abstraction of the extensive quantity of a phenomenon and represent to ourselves in the mere sensation in a certain momentum a synthesis of homogeneous assertion from zero up to the given empirical consciousness all sensations therefore as such are given only a posteriori but this property thereof namely that they have a degree can be known a priori 
it is worthy of remark that in respect to quantities in general we can cognize a priori only a single quality namely continuity but in respect to all quality the real in phenomena we cannot cognize a priori anything more than the intensive quantity thereof namely that they have a degree all else is left to experience three analogies of experience the principle of these is experience is possible only through the representation of a necessary connection of perceptions proof experience is an empirical cognition that is to say a cognition which determines an object by means of perceptions it is therefore a synthesis of perceptions a synthesis which is not itself contained in perception but which contains the synthetical unity of the manifold of perception in a consciousness and this unity constitutes the essential of our cognition of objects of the senses that is of experience not merely of intuition or sensation now in experience our perceptions come together contingently so that no character of necessity in their connection appears or can appear from the perceptions themselves because apprehension is only a placing together of the manifold of empirical intuition and no representation of a necessity in the connected existence of the phenomena which apprehension brings together is to be discovered therein but as experience is a cognition of objects by means of perception it follows that the relation of the existence of the existence of the manifold must be represented in experience not as it is put together in time but as it is objectively in time and as time itself cannot be perceived the determination of the existence of objects in time can only take place by means of their connection in time in general consequently only by means of a priori connecting concepts now as these conceptions always possess the character of necessity experience is possible only by means of a representation of the necessary connection of perception the three modi of time are permanence succession and coexistence accordingly there are three rules of all relations of time in phenomena according to which the existence of every phenomenon is determined in respect of the unity of all time and these antecede all experience and render it possible the general principle of all three analogies rests on the necessary unity of apperception in relation to all possible empirical consciousness perception at every time consequently as this unity lies a priori at the foundation of all mental operations the principle rests on the synthetical unity of all phenomena according to their relation in time for the original apperception relates to our internal sense 
the complex of all representations, and indeed relates a priori to its form, that is to say, the relation of the manifold empirical consciousness in time. Now this manifold must be combined in original apperception according to relations of time, a necessity imposed by the a priori transcendental unity of apperception, to which is subjected all that can belong to my, i.e. my own, cognition, and therefore all that can become an object for me. This synthetical and a priori determined unity in relation of perceptions in time is therefore the rule. Quote, All empirical determinations of time must be subject to rules of the general determination of time. End quote. And the analogies of experience of which we are now about to treat must be rules of this nature. The principles have this peculiarity, that they do not concern phenomena, and the synthesis of the empirical intuition thereof, but merely the existence of phenomena in their relation to each other in regard to existence. Now the mode in which we apprehend a thing in a phenomenon can be determined a priori in such a manner that the rule of its synthesis can give, that is to say, can produce this a priori intuition in every empirical example. But the existence of a phenomena can not be known a priori, and although we could arrive by this path at a conclusion of the fact of some existence, we could not cognize that existence determinately, that is to say, we should be incapable of anticipating in what respect the empirical intuition of it would be distinguishable from that of others. The two principles above mentioned, which I called mathematical in consideration of the fact of their authorizing the application of mathematic phenomena, relate to these phenomena only in regard to their possibility, and instruct us how phenomena, as far as regards their intuition, or the real in their perception, can be generated according to the rules of a mathematical synthesis. Consequently, numerical quantities, and with them the determination of a phenomenon as a quantity, can be employed in the one case as well as in the other. This, for example, out of 200,000 illuminations by the moon, I might compose and give a priori, that is, construct the degree of our sensations of the sunlight. We may therefore entitle these two principles constitutive. This case is very different with those principles whose province it is to subject the existence of phenomena to rules a priori. For, as existence does not admit of being constructed, it is clear that they must only concern the relations of existence and be merely regulative principles. In this case, therefore, neither axioms nor anticipations are to be thought of. Thus, if a perception is given us in a certain relation of time, to other, although undetermined, perceptions, we cannot then say a priori what and how great in quantity the other perception necessarily connected with the former is 
but only how it is connected, quote, its existence, in this given modus of time. Analogies in philosophy mean something very different from that which they represent in mathematics. In the latter they are formulae, which announce the equality of two relations of quantity, and are always constitutive, so that if two terms of the proportion are given, the third is also given, that is, can be constructed by the aid of these formulae. But in philosophy analogy is not the equality of two quantitative but of two qualitative relations. In this case, from the three given terms, I can give a priori and cognize the relation to a fourth member, but not this fourth term itself, although I certainly possess a rule to guide me in the search for this fourth term in experience and a mark to assist me in discovering it. An analogy of experience is therefore only a general rule according to which unity of experience must arise out of perceptions in respect to objects, phenomena, not as a constitutive but merely as a regulative principle. The same holds good also of the postulates of empirical thought in general, which relate to the synthesis of mere intuition, which concerns the form of phenomena, the synthesis of perception, which concerns the matter of phenomena, and the synthesis of experience, which concerns the relation of these perceptions. For they are only regulative principles and clearly distinguishable from the mathematical, which are constitutive, not indeed in regard to the certainty which both possess a priori, but in the mode of evidence thereof consequently also in the manner of demonstration. But what has been observed of all synthetical propositions, and must be particularly remarked in this place, is this, that these analogies possess significance and validity, not as principles of the transcendental but only as principles of the empirical use of the understanding, and their truth can therefore be proved only as such, and that consequently the phenomena must not be subjoined directly under the categories, but only under their schemata. For if the objects to which those principles must be applied were things in themselves, it would be quite impossible to cognize aught concerning them synthetically a priori. But they are nothing but phenomena, a complete knowledge of which, a knowledge to which all principles a priori must at least relate, is the only possible experience. It follows that these principles can have nothing else for their aim than the conditions of the empirical cognition in the unity of synthesis of phenomena. But this synthesis is cogitated only in the schema of the pure conception of the understanding, of whose unity as that of a synthesis in general the category contains the function unrestricted by any sensuous condition. These principles will therefore authorize us to connect phenomena according to an analogy with the logical and universal unity of conceptions and, consequently, to employ 
the categories in the principles themselves, but in the application of them to experience, we shall use only their schemata as the key to their proper application instead of the categories, or rather the latter as restricting conditions under the title of, quote, formulae of the former. A. First Analogy Principle of the Permanence of Substance in all changes of phenomena, substance is permitted, and the quantum thereof in nature is neither increased nor diminished. Proof All phenomena exist in time, wherein alone as substratum, that is, as the permanent form of the internal intuition, coexistence and succession can be represented. Consequently, time in which all changes of phenomena must be cogitated remains and changes not because it is that in which succession and coexistence can be represented only as determinations thereof. Now, time in itself cannot be an object of perception. It follows that in objects of perception, that is, in phenomena, there must be found a substratum which represents time in general, and in which all change or coexistence can be perceived by means of the relation of phenomena to it. But the substratum of all reality, that is, of all that pertains to the existence of things, is substance. All that pertains to existence can be cogitated only as a determination of substance. Consequently, the permanent, in relation to which alone can all relations of time in phenomena be determined, is substance in the world of phenomena, that is, the real in phenomena, that which as the substratum of all change remains ever the same. Accordingly, as this cannot change in existence, its quantity in nature can neither be increased nor diminished. Our apprehension of the manifold in a phenomenon is always successive, is consequently always changing. By it alone we could therefore never determine whether this manifold as an object of experience is coexistent or successive unless it had for a foundation something fixed and permanent, of the existence of which all succession and coexistence are nothing but so many modes, modi of time. Only in the permanent, then, are relations of time possible, for simultaneity and succession are the only relations in time. That is to say, the permanent is the substratum of our empirical representation of time itself, in which alone all determination of time is possible. Permanence is, in fact, just another expression for time, as the abiding correlate of all existence of phenomena and of all change, and of all coexistence. For change does not affect time itself, but only the phenomena in time. Just as coexistence cannot be regarded as a modus of time itself, seeing that in time no parts are coexistent, but all successive, if we were to attribute succession to time itself, 
we should be obliged to cogitate another time, in which this succession would be possible. It is only by means of the permanent that existence in different parts of the successive series of time receives a quantity which we entitle duration. For in mere succession, existence is perpetually vanishing and recommencing, and therefore never has even the least quantity. Without the permanent, then, no relation in time is possible. Now time in itself is not an object of perception. Consequently, the permanent in phenomena must be regarded as the substratum of all determination of time, and consequently also as the condition of the possibility of all synthetical unity of perceptions, that is, of experience, and all existence and all change in time can only be regarded as a mode in the existence of that which abides unchangeably. Therefore, in all phenomena, the permanent is the object in itself, that is, the substance phenomenon. But all that changes or can change belongs only to the mode of the existence of this substance of substances, consequently to its determinations. I find that in all ages not only the philosopher but even the common understanding has preposited this permanence as a substratum of all change in phenomena. Indeed, I am compelled to believe that they will always accept this as an indubitable fact. Only the philosopher expresses himself in a more precise and definite manner when he says, quote, In all changes in the world, the substance remains and the accidents alone are changeable. End quote but of this decidedly synthetical proposition I nowhere meet with even an attempt at proof, nay, it very rarely has the good fortune to stand, as it deserves to do, at the head of the pure and entirely a priori laws of nature. In truth, the statement that substance is permanent is tautological, for this very permanence is the ground on which we apply the category of substance to the phenomenon, and we should have been obliged to prove that in all phenomena there is something permanent, of the existence of which the changeable is nothing but a determination. But because a proof of this nature cannot be dogmatical, that is, cannot be drawn from conceptions, inasmuch as it concerns a synthetical proposition a priori, and as philosophers never reflect that such propositions are valid only in relation to possible experience, and therefore cannot be proved except by means of a deduction of the possibility of experience. It is no wonder that while it has served as the foundation of all experience, for we feel the need of it in empirical cognition, it has never been supported by proof. A philosopher was asked, quote, What is the weight of smoke? End quote. He answered, quote, Subtract from the weight of the burnt wood the weight of the remaining ashes, and you will have the weight of smoke, end quote. Thus he presumed it to be incontrovertible that even in fire the matter, substance, does not perish, but that only the form of it undergoes a change. In like manner was the saying, 
quote, from nothing comes nothing, end quote, only another inference from the principle or permanence, or rather of the ever-abiding existence of the true subject in phenomena. For if that in the phenomenon which we call substance is to be the proper substratum of all determination of time, it follows that all existence in past as well as in future time must be determinable by means of it alone. Hence we are entitled to apply the term substance to a phenomenon, only because we suppose its existence in all time, a notion which the word permanence does not fully express, as it seems rather to be referable to future time. However, the internal necessity perpetually to be is inseparably connected with the necessity always to have been, and so the expression may stand as it is, gignai di nihilo, nihili in nihilum nil posse reverti, footnote 30 to follow, are two propositions which the ancients never parted, and which people nowadays sometimes mistakenly disjoin, because they imagine that the propositions apply to objects as things in themselves, and that the former might be inimical to the dependence, even in respect of its substance also, of the world upon a supreme cause. But this apprehension is entirely needless, for the question in this case is only of phenomena in the sphere of experience, the unity of which never could be possible if we admitted the possibility that new things, in respect to their substance, should arise. For in that case we should lose altogether that which alone can represent the unity of time to wit the identity of the substratum, as to that through which alone all change possesses complete and thorough unity. This permanence is, however, nothing but the manner in which we represent to ourselves the existence of things in the phenomenal world. Footnote 30 Perseus Satire 83 to 84. Quote, nothing can be propounded from nothing, nothing can be returned into nothing. End quote. End footnote. The determinations of a substance, which are only particular modes of its existence, are called accidents. They are always real because they concern the existence of substance. Negations are only determinations which express the non-existence of something in the substance. Now, if to this real in the substance we ascribe a particular existence, for example, to motion as an accident of matter, this existence is called inherence. In contradistinction to the existence of substance, which we call subsistence, but hence arise many misconceptions, and it would be a more accurate and just mode of expression to designate the accident only as the mode in which the existence of a substance is positively determined. Meanwhile, by reason of the conditions of the logical exercise of our understanding, it is impossible to avoid separating, as it were, that which in the existence of a substance is subject to change, whilst the substance remains 
and regarding it in relation to that which is properly permanent and radical on this account this category of substance stands under the title of relation rather because it is the condition thereof than because it contains in itself any relation now upon this notion of permanence rests the proper notion of the conception change origin and extinction are not changes of that which originates or becomes extinct change is but a mode of existence what follows on another mode of existence of the same object hence all that changes is permanent and only the condition thereof changes now since this mutation affects only determinations which can have a beginning or an end we must say employing an expression which seems somewhat paradoxical quote, only the permanent substance is subject to change the mutable suffers no change but rather alteration that is when certain determinations cease others begin end quote. change when cannot be perceived by us except in substances and origin or extinction in an absolute sense that does not concern merely a determination of the permanent cannot be a possible perception for it is this very notion of the permanent which renders possible the representation of a transition from one state into another and from non-being to being which consequently can be empirically cognized only as alternating determinations of that which is permanent grant that a thing absolutely begins to be we must then have a point of time in which it was not but how and by what can we fix and determine this point of time unless by that which already exists for a void time preceding is not an object of perception but if we connect this beginning with objects which existed previously and which continue to exist till the object in question begins to be then the latter can only be a determination of the former as the permanent the same holds good of the notion of extinction for this presupposes the empirical representation of a time in which a phenomenon no longer exists substances in the world of phenomena are the substratum of all determinations of time the beginning of some and the ceasing to be of other substances would utterly do away with the only condition of the empirical unity of time and in that case phenomena would relate to two different times in which side by side existence would pass which is absurd for there is only one time in which all different times must be placed not as coexistent but as successive accordingly permanence is a necessary condition under which alone phenomena as things or objects are determinable in a possible experience but as regards the empirical criterion of this necessary permanence and with it of the substantiality of phenomena we shall find sufficient opportunity to speak of in the sequel 
End of section 13. Recording by Robert Scott. Mojo Move 411.com. M O J O M O V E 411.com. August the 27th, 2007. Section 14. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Transcendental Doctrine of Elements. Part Second. Transcendental Logic. First Division. Transcendental Analytic. Book Two. Transcendental Doctrine of the Faculty of Judgment, or Analytic of Principles. Chapter Two. System of All Principles of the Pure Understanding. Section Three. Systematic Representations of All Synthetical Principles of the Pure Understanding. 3. Analogies of Experience. Second Analogy. Principle of the Succession of Time. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant B. Second Analogy Principle of the Succession of Time According to the Law of Causality All changes take place according to the law of the connection of cause and effect. Proof That all phenomena in the succession of time are only changes, that is, a successive being and non-being of the determinations of substance which is permanent, Consequently, that a being of substance itself, which follows on the non-being thereof, or a non-being of substance, which follows on the being thereof, in other words, that the origin or extinction of substance itself is impossible, all of this has been fully established in treating of the foregoing principle. This principle might have been expressed as follows. All alteration or succession of phenomena is merely change. For the changes of substance are not origin or extinction, because the conception of change presupposes the same subject as existing with two opposite determinations, and consequently as permanent. After this premonition, we shall proceed to the proof. I perceive that phenomena succeed one another. That is to say, a state of things exists at one time, the opposite of which existed in a former state. In this case, then, I really connect together two perceptions in time. Now, connection is not an operation of mere sense and intuition, but is the product of a synthetical faculty of imagination, which determines the internal sense in respect of a relation of time. But imagination can connect these two states in two ways, so that either the one or the other may antecede in time. For time in itself cannot be an object of perception, and what in an object precedes and what follows cannot be empirically determined in relation to it. I am only conscious, then, that my imagination places one state before and the other after, not that the one state antecedes the other in the object. In other words, the objective relation of the successive phenomena remains quite undetermined by means of mere perception. Now, in order that this relation may be cognized as determined, the relation between the two states must be so cogitated that it is thereby determined as necessary, which of them must be placed before and which after and not conversely. But the conception which carries with it a necessity of synthetical unity can be none other than a pure conception of the understanding which does not lie in mere perception, and in this case it is the conception of the relation of cause and effect, the former of which determines the latter in time, as its necessary consequence, and not as something which might possibly antecede, or which might in some cases not be perceived to follow. It follows that it is only because we subject the sequence of phenomena, and consequently all change, to the law of causality, that experience itself, that is, empirical cognition of phenomena, becomes possible, and consequently that phenomena themselves, as objects of experience, are possible only by virtue of this law. Our apprehension of the manifold of phenomena is always successive. The representations of parts succeed one another. Whether they succeed one another in the object also is a second point for reflection which was not contained in the former. Now we may certainly give the name of object to everything, even to every representation, so far as we are conscious thereof. 
but what this word may mean in the case of phenomena not merely in so far as they as representations are objects but only in so far as they indicate an object is a question requiring deeper consideration in so far as they regarded merely as representations are at the same time objects of consciousness they are not to be distinguished from apprehension that is reception into the synthesis of imagination and we must therefore say the manifold of phenomena is always produced successively in the mind if phenomena were things in themselves no man would be able to conjecture from the succession of our representations how this manifold is connected in the object for we have to do only with our representations how things may be in themselves without regard to the representations through which they affect us is utterly beyond the sphere of our cognition now although phenomena are not things in themselves and are nevertheless the only thing given to us to be cognized it is my duty to show what sort of connection in time belongs to the manifold in phenomena themselves while the representation of this manifold in apprehension is always successive for example the apprehension of the manifold in the phenomenon of a house which stands before me is successive now comes the question whether the manifold of this house is in itself successive which no one will be at all willing to grant but so soon as i raise my conception of an object to the transcendental signification thereof i find that the house is not a thing in itself but only a phenomenon that is a representation the transcendental object of which remains utterly unknown what then am i to understand by the question how can the manifold be connected in the phenomenon itself not considered as a thing in itself but merely as a phenomenon here that which lies in my successive apprehension is regarded as representation whilst the phenomenon which is given me notwithstanding that it is nothing more than a complex of these representations is regarded as the object thereof with which my conception drawn from the representations of apprehension must harmonize it is very soon seen that as accordance of the cognition with its object constitutes truth the question now before us can only relate to the formal conditions of empirical truth and that the phenomenon in opposition to the representations of apprehension can only be distinguished therefrom as the object of them if it is subject to a rule which distinguishes it from every other apprehension and which renders necessary a mode of connection of the manifold that in the phenomenon which contains the condition of this necessary rule of apprehension is the object let us now proceed to our task that something happens that is to say that something or some state exists which before was not cannot be empirically perceived unless a phenomenon proceeds which does not contain in itself this state for a reality which should follow upon a void time in other words a beginning which no state of things proceeds can just as little be apprehended as the void time itself every apprehension of an event is therefore a perception which follows upon another perception but as this is the case with all synthesis of apprehension as i have shown above in the example of a house my apprehension of an event is not yet sufficiently distinguished from other apprehensions but i remark also that if in a phenomenon which contains an occurrence i call the antecedent state of my perception a and the following state b the perception b can only follow a in apprehension and the perception a cannot follow b but only precede it for example I see a ship float down the stream of a river. My perception of its place lower down follows upon my perception of its place higher up in the course of the river, and it is impossible that, in the apprehension of this phenomenon, the vessel should be perceived first below and afterwards higher up the stream. Here, therefore, the order in the sequence of perceptions and apprehension is determined, and by this order apprehension is regulated. In the former example, my perceptions in the apprehension of a house might begin at the roof and end at the foundation, or vice versa, or I might apprehend the manifold in this empirical intuition by going from left to right and from right to left. Accordingly, in the series of these perceptions there was no determined order, which necessitated my beginning at a certain point, in order empirically to connect the manifold. But this rule is always to be met with in the perception of that which happens, and it makes the order of the successive perceptions in the apprehension of such a phenomenon necessary. I must, therefore, in the present case, deduce the subjective sequence of apprehension from the objective sequence of phenomena, for otherwise the former is quite undetermined, and one phenomenon is not distinguishable from another. 
The former alone proves nothing as to the connection of the manifold in an object, for it is quite arbitrary. The latter must consist in the order of the manifold in a phenomenon, according to which order the apprehension of one thing, that which happens, follows that of another thing which proceeds in conformity with a rule. In this way alone can I be authorized to say of the phenomenon itself, and not merely of my own apprehension, that a certain order or sequence is to be found therein. That is, in other words, I cannot arrange my apprehension otherwise than in this order. In conformity with this rule, then, it is necessary that in that which antecedes an event there be found the condition of a rule, according to which in this event follows always and necessarily. But I cannot reverse this and go back from the event, and determine by apprehension that which antecedes it. For no phenomenon goes back from the succeeding point of time to the preceding point, although it does certainly relate to a preceding point of time. From a given time, on the other hand, there is always a necessary progression to the determined succeeding time. Therefore, because there certainly is something that follows, I must of necessity connect it with something else which antecedes, and upon which it follows in conformity with a rule, that is necessarily, so that the event as condition affords certain indication of a condition, and this condition determines the events. Let us suppose that nothing precedes an event, upon which this event must follow in conformity with a rule. All sequence of perception would then exist only in apprehension, that is to say, would be merely subjective, and it could not thereby be objectively determined what thing ought to precede and what ought to follow in perception. In such a case we should have nothing but a play of representations which would possess no application to any object. That is to say, it would not be possible through perception to distinguish one phenomenon from another as regards relations of time, because the succession in the act of apprehension would always be of the same sort, and therefore there would be nothing in the phenomenon to determine the succession, and to render a certain sequence objectively necessary. And in this case I cannot say that two states in a phenomenon follow one upon the other, but only that one apprehension follows upon another. But this is merely subjective, and does not determine an object, and consequently cannot be held to be cognition of an object, not even in the phenomenal world. Accordingly, when we know in experience that something happens, we always presuppose that something proceeds, whereupon it follows in conformity with a rule. For otherwise, I could not say of the object that it follows, because the mere succession in my apprehension, if it be not determined by a rule in relation to something preceding, does not authorize succession in the object. Only, therefore, in reference to a rule, according to which phenomena are determined in their sequence, that is, as they happen by the preceding state, can I make my subjective synthesis of apprehension objective, and it is only under this presupposition that even the experience of an event is possible. No doubt it appears as if this were in thorough contradiction to all the notions which people have hitherto entertained in regard to the procedure of the human understanding. According to these opinions, it is by means of the perception and comparison of similar consequences, following upon certain antecedent phenomena, that the understanding is led to the discovery of a rule, according to which certain events always follow certain phenomena. And it is only by this process that we attain to the conception of cause. Upon such a basis it is clear that this conception must be merely empirical, and the rule which it furnishes us with, everything that happens must have a cause, would be just as contingent as experience itself. The universality and necessity of the rule or law would be perfectly spurious attributes of it. Indeed, it could not possess universal validity, inasmuch as it would not in this case be a priori, but founded on deduction. But the same is the case with this law as with other pure a priori representations, e.g. space and time, which we can draw in perfect clearness and completeness from experience, only because we had already placed them therein, and by that means and by that alone had rendered experience possible. Indeed, the logical clearness of this representation of a rule, determining the series of events, is possible only when we have made use thereof in experience. Nevertheless, the recognition of this rule as a condition of the synthetical unity of phenomena in time was the ground of experience itself, and consequently preceded it a priori. It is now our duty to show by an example that we never, 
even in experience, attribute to an object, the notion of succession or effect, of an event, that is, the happening of something that did not exist before, and distinguish it from the subjective succession of apprehension, unless, when a rule lies at the foundation which compels us to observe this order of perception in preference to any other, and that, indeed, it is this necessity which first renders possible the representation of a succession in the object. We have representations within us, of which also we can be conscious. But however widely extended, however accurate and thoroughgoing this consciousness may be, these representations are still nothing more than representations, that is, internal determinations of the mind in this or that relation of time. Now, how it happens that to these representations we should set an object, or that, in addition to their subjective reality, as modifications we should still further attribute to them a certain unknown objective reality, it is clear that objective significancy cannot consist in a relation to another representation of that which we desire to term object, for in that case the question again arises, how does this other representation go out of itself, and obtain objective significancy over and above the subjective which is proper to it, as a determination of a state of mind? If we try to discover what sort of new property the relation to an object gives to our subjective representations, and what new importance they thereby receive, we shall find that this relation has no other effect than that of rendering necessary the connection of our representations in a certain manner, and of subjecting them to a rule and that, conversely, it is only because a certain order is necessary in the relations of time of our representations that objective significancy is ascribed to them. In the synthesis of phenomena, the manifold of our representations is always successive. Now, hereby is not represented an object, for by means of this succession, which is common to all apprehension, no one thing is distinguished from another. But so soon as I perceive or assume that in this succession there is a relation to a state antecedent, from which the representation follows in accordance with a rule, so soon do I represent something as an event, or as a thing that happens. In other words, I cognize an object to which I must assign a certain determinate position in time, which cannot be altered, because of the preceding state in the object. When, therefore, I perceive that something happens, there is contained in this representation in the first place the fact that something antecedes, because it is only in relation to this that the phenomenon obtains its proper relation of time, in other words, exists after an antecedent time in which it did not exist. But it can receive its determined place in time only by the presupposition that something existed in the foregoing state, upon which it follows inevitably and always, that is, in conformity with a rule. From all this it is evident that in the first place I cannot reverse the order of succession, and make that which happens precede that upon which it follows, and that in the second place, if the antecedent state be posited, a certain determinate event inevitably and necessarily follows. Hence it follows that there exists a certain order in our representations, whereby the present gives a sure indication of some previously existing state as a correlate, though still undetermined, of the existing event which is given a correlate which itself relates to the event as its consequence, conditions it, and connects it necessarily with itself in the series of time. If then it be admitted as a necessary law of sensibility, and consequently a formal condition of all perception, that the preceding necessarily determines the succeeding time, inasmuch as I cannot arrive at the succeeding except through the preceding, it must likewise be an indispensable law of empirical representation of the series of time, that the phenomena of the past determine all phenomena in the succeeding time, and that the latter, as events, cannot take place except in so far as the former determine their existence in time, that is to say, establish it according to a rule. For it is of course only in phenomena that we can empirically cognize this continuity in the connection of times. For all experience, and for the possibility of experience, understanding is indispensable, and the first step which it takes in this sphere is not to render the representation of objects clear, but to render the representation of an object in general, possible. It does this by applying the order of time to phenomena, and their existence. In other words, it assigns to each phenomenon, as a consequence, a place in relation to preceding phenomena, determined a priori in time without which it could not harmonize with time itself, which determines a place a priori to all its parts. 
this determination of place cannot be derived from the relation of phenomena to absolute time, for it is not an object of perception, but on the contrary, phenomena must reciprocally determine the places in time of one another, and render these necessary in the order of time. In other words, whatever follows or happens must follow in conformity with a universal rule upon that which was contained in the foregoing state. Hence arises a series of phenomena which by means of the understanding produces and renders necessary exactly the same order and continuous connection in the series of our possible perceptions as is founded a priori in the form of internal intuition, time, in which all our perceptions must have place. That something happens, then, is a perception which belongs to a possible experience, which becomes real only because I look upon the phenomenon as determined in regard to its place in time, consequently as an object, which can always be found by means of a rule in the connected series of my perceptions. But this rule of the determination of a thing according to succession in time is as follows. In what proceeds may be found the condition under which an event always, that is necessarily, follows. From all this it is obvious that the principle of cause and effect is the principle of possible experience, that is, of objective cognition of phenomena in regard to their relations in the succession of time. The proof of this fundamental proposition rests entirely on the following momenta of argument. To all empirical cognition belongs the synthesis of the manifold by the imagination, a synthesis which is always successive, that is, in which the representations therein always follow one another. But the order of succession in imagination is not determined, and the series of successive representations may be taken retrogressively as well as progressively. But if this synthesis is a synthesis of apprehension, of the manifold of a given phenomenon, then the order is determined in the object, or to speak more accurately, there is therein an order of successive synthesis which determines an object, and according to which something necessarily proceeds, and when this is posited, something else necessarily follows. If, then, my perception is to contain the cognition of an event, that is, of something which really happens, it must be an empirical judgment, wherein we think that the succession is determined. That is, it presupposes another phenomenon, upon which this event follows necessarily, or in conformity with a rule. If, on the contrary, when I posited the antecedent, the event did not necessarily follow, I should be obliged to consider it as merely a subjective play of my imagination, and if in this I represented to myself anything as objective, I must look upon it as a mere dream. Thus the relation of phenomena as possible perceptions, according to that which happens, is, as to its existence, necessarily determined in time by something which antecedes, in conformity with a rule. In other words, the relation of cause and effect is the condition of the objective validity of our empirical judgments in regard to the sequence of perceptions, consequently of their empirical truth, and therefore of experience. The principle of the relation of causality in the succession of phenomena is therefore valid for all objects of experience, because it is itself the ground of the possibility of experience. Here, however, a difficulty arises which must be resolved. The principle of the connection of causality among phenomena is limited in our formula to the succession thereof, although in practice we find that the principle applies also when the phenomena exist together in the same time, and that cause and effect may be simultaneous. For example, there is heat in a room which does not exist in the open air. I look about for the cause, and find it to be the fire. Now the fire as the cause is simultaneous with its effect, the heat of the room. In this case, then, there is no succession as regards time between cause and effect, but they are simultaneous, and still the law holds good. The greater part of operating causes in nature are simultaneous with their effects, and the succession in time of the latter is produced only because the cause cannot achieve the total of its effect in one moment. But at the moment when the effect first arises, it is always simultaneous with the causality of its cause, because if the cause had but a moment before ceased to be, the effect could not have arisen. Here it must be specially remembered that we must consider the order of time and not the lapse thereof. The relation remains even though no time has elapsed. The time between the causality of the cause and its immediate effect may entirely vanish, 
and the cause and effect be thus simultaneous, but the relation of one to the other remains always determinable according to time. If, for example, I consider a leaden ball, which lies upon a cushion and makes a hollow in it, as a cause, then it is simultaneous with the effect. But I distinguish the two through the relation of time of the dynamical connection of both. For if I lay the ball upon the cushion, then the hollow follows upon the before smooth surface. But supposing the cushion has from some cause or another a hollow, there does not thereupon follow a leaden ball. Thus the law of succession in time is in all instances the only empirical criterion of effect in relation to the causality of the antecedent cause. The glass is the cause of the rising of the water above its horizontal surface, although the two phenomena are contemporaneous. For as soon as I draw some water with the glass from a larger vessel, an effect follows thereupon, namely, the change of the horizontal state which the water had in the large vessel into a concave, which it assumes in the glass. This conception of causality leads us to the conception of action, that of action to the conception of force, and through it to the conception of substance. As I do not wish this critical essay, the sole purpose of which is to treat of the sources of our synthetical cognition a priori, to be crowded with analyses which merely explain, but do not enlarge, the sphere of our conceptions, I reserve the detailed explanation of the above conceptions for a future system of pure reason. Such an analysis, indeed, executed with great particularity, may already be found in well-known works on this subject, but I cannot at present refrain from making a few remarks on the empirical criterion of a substance, in so far as it seems to be more evident and more easily recognized through the conception of action than through that of the permanence of a phenomenon. Where action, consequently activity and force, exists, substance also must exist, and in it alone must be sought the seed of that fruitful source of phenomena. Very well. But if we are called upon to explain what we mean by substance, and wish to avoid the vice of reasoning in a circle, the answer is by no means so easy. How shall we conclude immediately from the action to the permanence of that which acts, this being nevertheless an essential and peculiar criterion of substance, phenomenon? But after what has been said above, the solution of this question becomes easy enough, although by the common mode of procedure, merely analyzing our conceptions, it would be quite impossible. The conception of action indicates the relation of the subject of causality to the effect. Now because all effect consists in that which happens, therefore in the changeable, the last subject thereof is the permanent, as the substratum of all that changes, that is, substance. For according to the principle of causality, actions are always the first ground of all change in phenomena, and consequently cannot be a property of a subject which itself changes, because if this were the case, other actions and another subject would be necessary to determine this change. From all this it results that action alone, as an empirical criterion, is a sufficient proof of the presence of substantiality, without any necessity on my part of endeavouring to discover the permanence of substance by a comparison. Besides, by this mode of induction we could not attain to the completeness which the magnitude and strict universality of this conception requires. For that the primary subject of the causality of all arising and passing away, all origin and extinction, cannot itself, in the sphere of phenomena, arise and pass away, is a sound and safe conclusion, a conclusion which leads us to the conception of empirical necessity and permanence in existence, and consequently to the conception of a substance as phenomenon. When something happens, the mere fact of the occurrence, without regard to that which occurs, is an object requiring investigation. The transition from the non-being of a state into the existence of it, supposing that this state contains no quality which previously existed in the phenomenon, is a fact of itself demanding enquiry. Such an event, as has been shown in number A, does not concern substance, for substance does not thus originate, but its condition and state. It is therefore only change, and not origin from nothing. 
If this origin be regarded as the effect of a foreign cause, it is termed creation, which cannot be admitted as an event among phenomena, because the very possibility of it would annihilate the unity of experience. If, however, I regard all things not as phenomena, but as things in themselves, and objects of understanding alone, they, although substances, may be considered as dependent in respect of their existence on a foreign cause. But this would require a very different meaning in the words, a meaning which could not apply to phenomena as objects of possible experience. How a thing can be changed how it is possible that, upon one state existing in one point of time, an opposite state should follow in another point of time. Of this we have not the smallest conception a priori. There is requisite for this the knowledge of real powers, which can only be given empirically. For example, knowledge of moving forces, or in other words, of certain successive phenomena, as movements, which indicate the presence of such forces. But the form of every change, the condition under which it alone can take place as the coming into existence of another state, be the content of the change, that is, the state which is changed what it may, and consequently the succession of the states themselves, can very well be considered a priori in relation to the law of causality and the conditions of time. It must be remarked that I do not speak of the change of certain relations, but of the change of the state. Thus when a body moves in a uniform manner, it does not change its state of motion, but only when all motion increases or decreases. When a substance passes from one state, A, into another state, B, the point of time in which the latter exists is different from, and subsequent to, that in which the former existed. In like manner, the second state, as reality in the phenomenon differs from the first, in which the reality of the second did not exist as B from zero. That is to say, if the state B differs from the state A only in respect to the quantity, the change is a coming into existence of B to A, which in the former state did not exist, and in relation to which that state is zero. Now the question arises, how a thing passes from one state, A, into another state? b. Between two moments there is always a certain time, and between two states existing in these moments there is always a difference having a certain quantity, for all parts of phenomena are in their turn quantities. Consequently, every transition from one state into another is always effected in a time contained between two moments, of which the first determines the state which leaves, and the second determines the state into which the thing passes. Both moments, then, are limitations of the time of a change, consequently of the intermediate state between both, and as such they belong to the total of the change. Now every change has a cause, which evidences its causality in the whole time during which the change takes place. The cause, therefore, does not produce the change all at once or in one moment, but in a time, so that as the time gradually increases from the commencing instant, A, to its completion at B, in like manner also the quantity of the reality, B to A, is generated through the lesser degrees which are contained between the first and last. All cause is therefore possible only through a continuous action of the causality, which in so far as it is uniform, we call a momentum. The change does not consist of these momenta, but is generated or produced by them as their effect. Such is the law of the continuity of all change, the ground of which is that neither time itself nor any phenomenon in time consists of parts which are the smallest possible, but that notwithstanding, the state of a thing passes in the process of a change through all these parts, as elements, to its second state. There is no smallest degree of reality in a phenomenon just as there is no smallest degree in the quantity of time, and so the new state of reality grows up out of the former state, through all the infinite degrees thereof, the differences of which one from another, taken altogether, are less than the difference between O and A. It is not our business to inquire here into the utility of this principle in the investigation of nature, but how such a proposition, which appears so greatly to extend our knowledge of nature, is possible completely a priori, is indeed a question which deserves investigation, although the first view seems to demonstrate the truth and reality of the principle, and the question how it is possible may be considered superfluous. 
for there are so many groundless pretensions to the enlargement of our knowledge by pure reason, that we must take it as a general rule to be mistrustful of all such, and without a thorough-going and radical deduction, to believe nothing of the sort even on the clearest dogmatical evidence. Every addition to our empirical knowledge, and every advance made in the exercise of our perception, is nothing more than an extension of the determination of the internal sense, that is to say, a progression in time, be objects themselves what they may, phenomena are pure intuitions. This progression in time determines everything, and is itself determined by nothing else, that is to say, the parts of the progression exist only in time, and by means of the synthesis thereof, and are not given antecedently to it. For this reason, every transition in perception to anything which follows upon another in time, is a determination of time by means of the production of this perception. And as this determination of time is always and in all its parts a quantity, the perception produced is to be considered as a quantity which proceeds through all its degrees, no one of which is the smallest possible, from zero up to its determined degree. From this we perceive the possibility of cognizing, a priori, a law of changes, a law, however, which concerns their form merely. We merely anticipate our own apprehension, the formal condition of which, inasmuch as it is itself to be found in the mind antecedently to all given phenomena, must certainly be capable of being cognized, a priori. Thus, as time contains the sensuous condition a priori of the possibility of a continuous progression of that which exists to that which follows it, the understanding, by virtue of the unity of a perception, contains the condition a priori of the possibility of a continuous determination of the position in time of all phenomena, and this by means of the series of causes and effects, the former of which necessitate the sequence of the latter and thereby render, universally and for all time, and by consequence objectively, valid the empirical cognition of the relations of time. End of section 14 Section 15 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part Second Transcendental Logic First Division Transcendental Analytic Book Two Transcendental Doctrine of the Faculty of Judgment or Analytic of Principles Chapter Two System of All Principles of the Pure Understanding Section Three Systematic Representations of All Synthetical Principles of the Pure Understanding 3. Analogies of Experience 3rd Analogy, Principle of Coexistence Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri 3rd Analogy Principle of Coexistence, According to the Law of Reciprocity or Community All substances, in so far as they can be perceived in space at the same time, exist in a state of complete reciprocity of action. Proof Things are coexistent when, in empirical intuition, the perception of the one can follow upon the perception of the other, and vice versa, which cannot occur in the succession of phenomena, as we have shown in the explanation of the second principle. Thus, I can perceive the moon and then the earth, or conversely, first the earth and then the moon, and for the reason that my perceptions of these objects can reciprocally follow each other, I say they exist contemporaneously. Now, coexistence is the existence of the manifold in the same time, but time itself is not an object of perception, and therefore we cannot conclude from the fact that things are placed in the same time the other fact, that the perception of these things can follow each other reciprocally. The synthesis of the imagination in apprehension would only present to us each of these perceptions as present in the subject when the other is not present, and contrariwise, but would not show that the objects are coexistent, that is to say, that if the one exists, the other also exists in the same time, and that this is necessarily so, in order that the perceptions may be capable of following each other reciprocally. 
it follows that a conception of the understanding or category of the reciprocal sequence of the determinations of phenomena, existing as they do, apart from each other, and yet contemporaneously, is requisite to justify us in saying that the reciprocal succession of perceptions has its foundation in the object, and to enable us to represent coexistence as objective. But that relation of substances in which one contains determinations, the ground of which is in the other substance, is the relation of influence. And when this influence is reciprocal, it is the relation of community or reciprocity. Consequently, the coexistence of substances in space cannot be cognized in experience, otherwise than under the precondition of their reciprocal action. This is therefore the condition of the possibility of things themselves as objects of experience. Things are coexistent, in so far as they exist in one and the same time, but how can we know that they exist in one and the same time? Only by observing that the order in the synthesis of apprehension of the manifold is arbitrary and a matter of indifference, that is to say, that it can proceed from A through B, C, D to E, or contrariwise from E to A. For if they were successive in time, and in the order let us suppose which begins with A, it is quite impossible for the apprehension in perception to begin with E and go backwards to A, inasmuch as A belongs to past time, and therefore cannot be an object of apprehension. Let us assume that in a number of substances considered as phenomena, each is completely isolated, that is, no one acts upon another. Then I say, that the coexistence of these cannot be an object of possible perception, and that the existence of one cannot by any mode of empirical synthesis lead us to the existence of another. For we imagine them in this case to be separated by a completely void space, and thus perception, which proceeds from the one to the other in time, would indeed determine their existence by means of a following perception, but would be quite unable to distinguish whether the one phenomenon follows objectively upon the first, or is coexistent with it. Besides the mere fact of existence, then, there must be something by means of which A determines the position of B in time, and conversely, B the position of A, because only under this condition can substances be empirically represented as existing contemporaneously. Now that alone determines the position of another thing in time, which is the cause of it, or of its determinations. Consequently, every substance, inasmuch as it can have succession predicated of it only in respect of its determinations, must contain the causality of certain determinations in another substance, and at the same time the effects of the causality of the other in itself. That is to say, substances must stand, immediately or immediately, in dynamical community with each other, if coexistence is to be cognized in any possible experience. But in regard to objects of experience, that is absolutely necessary, without which the experience of these objects would itself be impossible. Consequently, it is absolutely necessary that all substances in the world of phenomena, in so far as they are coexistent, stand in a relation of complete community of reciprocal action to each other. The word community has in our language, footnote 32, German, two meanings and contains the two notions conveyed in the Latin communio and commercium. We employ it in this place in the latter sense, that of a dynamical community, without which even the community of place, communio spazi, could not be empirically cognized. In our experiences, it is easy to observe that it is only the continuous influences in all parts of space that can conduct our senses from one object to another, that the light which plays between our eyes and the heavenly bodies produces a mediating community between them and us, and thereby evidences their coexistence with us. That we cannot empirically change our position, perceive this change, unless the existence of matter throughout the whole of space rendered possible the perception of the positions we occupy, and that this perception can prove the contemporaneous existence of these places only through their reciprocal influence, and thereby also the coexistence of even the most remote objects, although in this case the proof is only mediate. Without community, every perception of a phenomenon in space is separated from every other and isolated, and the chain of empirical representations, that is, of experience, must with the appearance of a new object begin entirely de novo. 
without the least connection with preceding representations, and without standing towards these even in the relation of time. My intention here is by no means to combat the notion of empty space, for it may exist where our perceptions cannot exist, inasmuch as they cannot reach thereto, and where therefore no empirical perception of coexistence takes place. But in this case it is not an object of possible experience. The following remarks may be useful in the way of explanation. In the mind, all phenomena, as contents of a possible experience, must exist in community, communio, of apperception or consciousness, and in so far as it is requisite that objects be represented as coexistent and connected, in so far must they reciprocally determine the position in time of each other, and thereby constitute a whole. If this subjective community is to rest upon an objective basis, or to be applied to substances as phenomena, the perception of one substance must render possible the perception of another, and conversely. For otherwise succession, which is always found in perceptions as apprehensions, would be predicated of external objects, and their representation of their coexistence be thus impossible. But this is a reciprocal influence, that is to say, a real community, commercium, of substances without which, therefore, the empirical relation of coexistence would be a notion beyond the reach of our mind. By virtue of this commercium, phenomena, in so far as they are apart from, and nevertheless in connection with each other, constitute a compositum reale. Such composita are possible in many different ways. The three dynamical relations, then, from which all others spring, are those of inherence, consequence, and composition. These, then, are the three analogies of experience. They are nothing more than principles of the determination of the existence of phenomena in time, according to the three modi of this determination, to wit, the relation to time itself as a quantity, the quantity of existence, that is, duration, the relation in time as a series or succession, finally, the relation in time as the complex of all existence, simultaneity. This unity of determination in regard to time is thoroughly dynamical. That is to say, time is not considered as that in which experience determines immediately to every existence its position, for this is impossible, inasmuch as absolute time is not an object of perception by means of which phenomena can be connected with each other. On the contrary, the rule of the understanding, through which alone the existence of phenomena can receive synthetical unity as regards relations of time, determines for every phenomenon its position in time, and consequently a priori, and with validity for all and every time. By nature, in the empirical sense of the word, we understand the totality of phenomena connected, in respect of their existence, according to necessary rules, that is, laws. There are therefore certain laws, which are moreover a priori, which make nature possible, and all empirical laws can exist only by means of experience, and by virtue of those primitive laws through which experience itself becomes possible. The purpose of the analogies is therefore to represent to us the unity of nature in the connection of all phenomena under certain exponents, the only business of which is to express the relation of time, in so far as it contains all existence in itself, to the unity of apperception, which can exist in synthesis only according to rules. The combined expression of all is this. All phenomena exist in one nature, and must so exist, inasmuch as without this a priori unity, no unity of experience, and consequently no determination of objects in experience, is possible. As regards the mode of proof which we have employed in treating of these transcendental laws of nature, and the peculiar character of we must make one remark, which will at the same time be important as a guide in every other attempt to demonstrate the truth of intellectual and likewise synthetical propositions a priori. Had we endeavoured to prove these analogies dogmatically, that is, from conceptions, that is to say, had we employed this method in attempting to show that everything which exists exists only in that which is permanent, that every thing or event presupposes the existence of something in a preceding state, upon which it follows in conformity with a rule. Lastly, that in the manifold, which is coexistent, the states coexist in connection with each other according to a rule, all our labour would have been utterly in vain. 
for more conceptions of things, analyze them as we may, cannot enable us to conclude from the existence of one object to the existence of another. What other course was left for us to pursue? This only, to demonstrate the possibility of experience as a cognition in which at last all objects must be capable of being presented to us, if the representation of them is to possess any objective reality. Now in this third, this mediating term, the essential form of which consists in the synthetical unity of the apperception of all phenomena, we found a priori conditions of the universal and necessary determination as to time of all existences in the world of phenomena, without which the empirical determination thereof as to time would itself be impossible. And we also discovered rules of synthetical unity a priori by means of which we could anticipate experience. For want of this method, and from the fancy that it was possible to discover a dogmatical proof of the synthetical propositions which are requisite in the empirical employment of the understanding, has it happened that a proof of the principle of sufficient reason has been so often attempted, and always in vain. The other two analogies nobody has ever thought of, although they have always been silently employed by the mind, because the guiding thread furnished by the categories was wanting, the guide which alone can enable us to discover every hiatus, both in the system of conceptions and of principles. Footnote 33. The unity of the universe, in which all phenomena to be connected, is evidently a mere consequence of the admitted principle of the community of all substances which are coexistent. For were substances isolated, they could not as parts constitute a whole, and were their connection, reciprocal action of the manifold, not necessary from the very fact of coexistence, we could not conclude from the fact of the latter as a merely ideal relation to the former as a real one. We have, however, shown in its place that community is the proper ground of the possibility of an empirical cognition of coexistence, and that we may therefore properly reason from the latter to the former as its condition. End of section 15. Section 16. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Transcendental Doctrine of Elements. Part 2nd. Transcendental Logic. First Division. Transcendental Analytic. Book 2. Transcendental Doctrine of the Faculty of Judgment, or Analytic of Principles. Chapter 2. System of all principles of the pure understanding. Section 3. Systematic representations of all synthetical principles of the pure understanding. 4. The postulates of empirical thought. Read by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, April 2007. The Postulates of Empirical Thought. 1. That which agrees with the formal conditions, parens, intuition and conception, and parens, of experience, is possible. 2. That which coheres with the material conditions of experience, parens, sensation, and parens, is real. 3. That whose coherence with the real is determined according to universal conditions of experience is, parens, exists, and parens, necessary. Explanation The categories of modality possess this peculiarity, that they do not in the least determine the object, or enlarge the conception to which they are annexed as predicates, but only express its relation to the faculty of cognition. Though my conception of a thing is in itself complete, I am still entitled to ask whether the object of it is merely possible or whether it is also real, or, if the latter, whether it is also necessary. But hereby the object itself is not more definitely determined in thought, but the question is only in what relation it, including all its determinations, stands to the understanding and its employment in experience, to the empirical faculty of judgment, and to the reason of its application to experience. For this very reason, too, the categories of modality are nothing more than explanations of the conceptions of possibility, reality, and necessity, as employed in experience. And at the same time, 
restrictions of all the categories to empirical use alone, not authorizing the transcendent employment of them. For if they are to have something more than a merely logical significance, and to be something more than a mere analytical expression of the form of thought, and to have a relation to things in their possibility, reality, or necessity, they must concern possible experience and its synthetical unity, in which alone objects of cognition can be given. The postulate of the possibility of things requires also that the conception of the things agree with the formal conditions of our experience in general. But this, that is to say the objective form of experience, contains all the kinds of synthesis which are requisite for the cognition of objects. A conception which contains a synthesis must be regarded as empty and, without reference to an object, if its synthesis does not belong to experience, either is borrowed from it and, in this case, it is called an empirical conception, or such as is the ground in a priori condition of experience, parentheses its form, and parentheses, and in this case it is pure conception, a conception which nevertheless belongs to experience, inasmuch as its object can be found in this alone. For where shall we find the criterion or character of a possibility of an object which is cogitated by means of an a priori synthetical conception, if not in the synthesis which constitutes the form of empirical cognition of objects? That in such a conception no contradiction exists is indeed a necessary logical condition, but very far from being sufficient to establish the objective reality of the conception, that is, the possibility of such an object as is thought in the conception. Thus, in the conception of a figure which is contained within two straight lines, there is no contradiction, for the conceptions of two straight lines and of their junction contain no negation of a figure. The impossibility in such a case does not rest upon the conception in itself, but upon the construction of it in space, that is to say, upon the conditions of space and its determinations. But these have themselves objective reality, that is, they apply to possible things, because they contain a priori the form of experience in general. And now we shall proceed to point out the extensive utility and influence of this postulate of possibility. When I represent to myself a thing that is permanent, so that everything in it which changes belongs merely to its state or condition, from such a conception alone I never can cognize that such a thing is possible. Or, if I represent to myself something which is so constituted that, when it is posited, something else follows always and infallibly, my thought contains no self-contradiction. But whether such a property as causality is to be found in any possible thing, my thought alone affords no mean of judging. Finally, I can represent to myself different things, parens, substances, and parens, which are so constituted that the state or condition of one causes a change in the state of the other, and reciprocally. But whether such a relation is a property of things cannot be perceived from these conceptions, which contain merely arbitrary synthesis. Only from the fact, therefore, that these conceptions express a priori the relations of perceptions in every experience, do we know that they possess objective reality, that is, transcendental truth. And that, independent of experience, though not independent of all relation to form of an experience in general and its synthetic unity, in which alone objects can be empirically cognized. But when we fashion to ourselves new conception of substances, forces, action, and reaction from the material presented to us by perception, without following the example of experience in their connection, we create mere chimeras of the possibility of which we cannot discover any criterion because we have not taken experience for unstructress, although we have borrowed the conceptions from her. Such fictitious conceptions derive their character of possibility not, like the categories, a priori, as conceptions on which all experience depends, but only a posteriori, as conceptions given by means of experience itself, and their possibility must either be cognized a posteriori and empirically, or it cannot be cognized at all. A substance which is permanently present in space, yet without filling it, friends, like that tertium quid between matter and the thinking subject which some have tried to introduce into metaphysics, close parens, or a peculiar fundamental power of the mind of intuiting the future by anticipation, parens, instead of merely inferring from past and present events, and parens, or, finally, a power of the mind to place itself in community of thought with other men, however distant they may be. 
These are conceptions the possibility of which has no ground to rest upon. For they are not based upon experience and its known laws, and without experience they are merely arbitrary conjunction of thoughts, which though containing no internal contradiction, has no claim to objective reality, neither consequently to the possibility of such an object as is thought in these conceptions. As far as concerns reality, it is self-evident that we cannot cogitate such a possibility in concreto without the aid of experience, because reality is concerned only with sensation, as the matter of experience, and not with the form of thought, with which we can no doubt indulge in shaping fancies. But I pass by everything which derives its possibility from reality and experience, and I purpose treating here merely of the possibility of things by means of a priori conceptions. I maintain, then, that the possibility of things is not derived from such conceptions per se, but only when considered as formal and objective conditions of an experience in general. It seems, indeed, as if the possibility of a triangle could be cognized from the conception of it alone, friends, which is certainly independent of experience, and friends, for we can certainly give to the conception a corresponding object completely a priori, that is to say, we can construct it. But as a triangle is only the form of an object, it must remain a mere product of the imagination, and the possibility of the existence of an object corresponding to it must remain doubtful unless we can discover some other ground, unless we know that the figure can be cogitated under conditions upon which all objects of experience rest. Now, the fact that space is a formal condition a priori of external experience, that the formative synthesis by which we construct a triangle in imagination is the very same that we employ in the apprehension of a phenomenon for the purpose of making an empirical conception of it, are what alone connect the notion of the possibility of such a thing with the conception of it. In the same manner, the possibility of continuous quantities, indeed of quantities in general, for the conceptions of them are without exception synthetical, is never evident from the conceptions themselves, but only when they are considered as the formal conditions of the determination of objects in experience. And where indeed should we look for objects to correspond to our conceptions, if not in experience, by which alone objects are presented to us? It is, however, true that without antecedent experience, we can cognize and characterize the possibility of things relatively to the formal conditions under which something is determined in experience as an object, consequently completely a priori. But still this is possible only in relation to experience and within its limits. The postulate concerning the cognition of the reality of things requires perception, consequently conscious sensation, not indeed immediately, that is, of the object itself, whose existence is to be cognized, but still that the object have some connection with a real perception, in accordance with the analogies of experience, which exhibit all kinds of real connection and experience. From the mere conception of a thing, it is impossible to conclude its existence. For, let the conception be ever so complete, and containing a statement of all the determinations of the thing, the existence of it has nothing to do with all this, but only with the question whether such a thing is given, so that the perception of it can in every case precede the conception. For the fact that the conception of it precedes the perception merely indicates the possibility of its existence. It is perception which presents matter to the conception that is the sole criterion of reality. Prior to perception of the thing, however, and therefore comparatively a priori, we are able to cognize its existence provided it stands in connection with some perceptions according to the principles of the empirical conjunction of these, that is, in conformity with the analogies of perception. For in this case, the existence of the supposed thing is connected with our perception in a possible experience, and we are able, with the guidance of these analogies, to reason in the series of possible perceptions from a thing which we do really perceive to the thing that we do not perceive. Thus, we cognize the existence of a magnetic matter penetrating all bodies from the perception of the attraction of the steel filings by the magnet, although the constitution of our organs render an immediate perception of this matter impossible for us. For according to the laws of sensibility and the connected context of our perceptions, we should in experience come also on immediate empirical intuition of this matter, if our senses were more acute. But this obtuseness has no influence upon and cannot alter the form of possible experience in general. 
Our knowledge of the existence of things reaches as far as our perceptions, and what may be inferred from them according to empirical laws extend. If we do not set out from experience, or do not proceed according to the laws of the empirical connection of phenomenon, our pretensions to discover the existence of a thing which we do not immediately perceive are vain. Idealism, however, brings forward powerful objections to these rules for proving existence immediately. This is, therefore, the proper place for its refutation. Refutation of Idealism Idealism, I mean material idealism, is the theory which declares the existence of objects in space without us to be either 1. doubtful and indemonstrable, or 2. false and impossible. The first is the problematic idealism of Descartes, who admits the undoubted certainty of only one empirical assertion, parentheses assertio, and parentheses to wit, I am. The second is the dogmatical idealism of Berkeley, who maintains that space, together with all the objects of which it is the inseparable condition, is a thing which is in itself impossible, and that consequently the objects in space are mere products of the imagination. The dogmatical theory of idealism is unavoidable if we regard space as the property of things in themselves, for in that case it is, with all to which it serves as condition, a non-entity. But the foundation for this kind of idealism we have already destroyed in the transcendental aesthetic. Problematical idealism, which makes no such assertion, but only alleges our incapacity to prove the existence of anything besides ourselves by means of immediate experience, is a theory rational and evidencing a thorough and philosophical mode of thinking, for it observes the rule not to form a decisive judgment before sufficient proof be shown. The desired proof must therefore demonstrate that we have experience of external things, and not mere fancies. For this purpose we must prove that our internal and, to Descartes, indubitable experience is itself possible only under the previous assumption of external experience. Theorem the simple but empirically determined consciousness of my own existence proves the existence of external objects in space. Proof I am conscious of my own existence as determined in time. All determination in regard to time presupposes the existence of something permanent in perception. But this permanent something cannot be something in me, for the very reason that my existence in time is itself determined by this permanent something. It follows that the perception of this permanent existence is possible only through a thing without me, and not through the mere representation of a thing without me. Consequently, the determination of my existence in time is possible only through the existence of real things external to me. Now, consciousness in time is necessarily connected with the consciousness of the possibility of this determination in time. Hence, it follows that consciousness in time is necessarily connected also with the existence of things without me inasmuch as the existence of these things is the condition of determination in time. That is to say, the consciousness of my own existence is at the same time an immediate consciousness of the existence of other things without me. Remark 1. The reader will observe that in the foregoing proof the game which idealism plays is retorted upon itself, and with more justice. It assumed that only immediate experience is internal, and that from this we can only infer the existence of external things. But, as always happens, when we reason from given effects to determine causes, idealism is reasoned with too much haste and uncertainty. For it is quite possible that the cause of our representations may lie in ourselves, and that we ascribe it falsely to external things. But our proof shows that external experience is properly immediate, that only by virtue of it, not indeed the consciousness of our own existence, but certainly the determination of our existence in time, that is, internal experience, is possible. Footnote. The immediate consciousness of the existence of external things is, in the preceding theorem, not presupposed but proved by the possibility of this consciousness understood by us or not. The question as to the possibility of it would stand thus. Quote, have we an internal sense but no external sense, and is our belief in external perceptions a mere delusion? But it is evident that, in order to merely fancy to ourselves anything is external, that is, to present it to the sense and intuition, we must already possess an external sense, and must thereby distinguish immediately 
the mere receptivity of an external intuition from the spontaneity which characterizes every act of imagination. For merely to imagine also an external sense would annihilate the faculty of intuition itself, which is to be determined by the imagination. End footnote. It is true that the representation, quote, I am, end quote, which is the expression of the consciousness which can accompany all my thoughts, is that which immediately includes the existence of a subject. But in this representation, we cannot find any knowledge of the subject, and therefore also no empirical knowledge, that is, experience. For experience contains, in addition to the thought of something existing, intuition, and in this case must be internal intuition, that is time, in relation to which the subject must be determined. But the existence of external things is absolutely requisite for this purpose, so that it follows that internal experience is itself possible only immediately and through external experience. Remark 2. Now with this view, all empirical use of our faculty of cognition in the determination of time is in perfect accordance. Its truth is supported by the fact that it is possible to perceive a determination of time only by means of a change in external relations motion and prens to the permanent in space prens for example we become aware of the sun's motion by observing the changes of his relation to the objects of this earth and prens period but that is not all we find that we possess nothing permanent that can correspond and be submitted to the conception of a substance as intuition except matter this idea of permanence is not itself derived from external experience but is an a priori necessary condition of all determination of time, consequently also of the internal sense in reference to our own existence, and that through the existence of external things. In the representation, quote, I, the consciousness of myself is not an intuition, but a merely intellectual representation produced by the spontaneous activity of a thinking subject. It follows that this I has not any predicate of intuition, which, in its character of permanence, could serve as the correlate to the determination of time in the internal sense, in the same way as impenetrability is the correlate of matter as an empirical intuition. Remark 3. From the fact that the existence of external things is a necessary condition to the possibility of a determined consciousness of ourselves, it does not follow that every intuitive representation of external things involves the existence of these things. For the representations may very well be the mere products of the imagination, parens, in dreams as well as in madness, and parens, though indeed these are themselves created by the reproduction of previous external perceptions, which, as has been shown, are possible only through the reality of external objects. The sole aim of our remarks has, however, been to prove that internal experience in general is possible only through the external experience in general. Whether this or that supposed experience be purely imaginary must be discovered from its particular determinations and by comparing these with the criteria of all real experience. Finally, as regards the third postulate, it applies to material necessity in existence and not to merely formal and logical necessity in the connection of conceptions. Now, as we cannot cognize completely a priori the existence of any object of sense, though we can do so comparatively a priori, that is, relatively to some other previously given existence, a cognition, however, which can only be of such an existence as must be contained in the complex of experience, of which the previously given perception is a part. The necessity of existence can never be cognized from conceptions, but always, on the contrary, from its connection with that which is an object of perception. But the only existence cognized under the condition of other given phenomena, unnecessary, is the existence of effects from given causes in conformity with the laws of causality. It is consequently not the necessity of the existence of things, open parens, as substances, and parens, but the necessity of the state of things that we cognize, and that not immediately, but by means of the existence of other states given in perception, according to empirical laws of causality. Hence it follows that the criterion of necessity is to be found only in the law of possible experience, that everything which happens is determined a priori in the phenomena by its cause. Thus we cognize only the necessity of effects in nature, the causes of which are given us. Moreover, the criterion of necessity in existence possesses no application beyond the field of possible experience, and even in this it is not valid of the existence of things as substances, because these can never be considered as empirical effects 
or something that happens and has a beginning. Necessity, therefore, regards only the relations of phenomena according to the dynamical law of causality, and the possible ground thereon of reasoning from some given existence open parens, of a cause close parens, a priori to another existence open parens, of an effect close parens. Quote, everything that happens is hypothetically necessary is a principle which subjects the changes that take place in the world to a law that is to a rule of necessary existence without which nature herself could not possibly exist hence the proposition quote, nothing happens by blind chance friends in mundo non detercasus end quote, is an a priori law of nature the case is the same with the proposition quote, necessity in nature is not blind end quote. That is, it is condition, consequently intelligible necessity, open parens, non data fartum, close parens. Both laws subject the play of change to, quote, a nature of things, open parens, as phenomena, close parens, close quote, or, which is the same thing, to the unity of the understanding, and through the understanding alone can changes belong to an experience, as a synthetical unity of phenomena. Both belong to the class of dynamical principles. The former is properly a consequence of the principle of causality, one of the analogies of experience. The latter belongs to the principles of modality, which to the determination of causality adds the conception of necessity, which is itself, however, subject to a rule of the understanding. The principle of continuity forbids any leap in the series of phenomena regarded as changes, friends in mundo non dutter saltus, close friends, and likewise in the complex of all empirical intuitions in space, any break or hiatus between two phenomena, open parens, known data hiatus, close parens, for we can so express the principle that the experience can admit nothing which proves the existence of a vacuum, or which even admits it as part of an empirical synthesis. For, as regards a vacuum or void, which we may cogitate as out and beyond the field of possible experience, parens the world, close parens, such a question cannot come before the tribunal of mere understanding, which decides only upon questions that concern the employment of given phenomena for the construction of empirical cognition. It is rather a problem for ideal reason, which passes beyond the sphere of a possible experience and aims at forming a judgment of that which surrounds and circumscribes it, and the proper place for the consideration of it is the transcendental dialectic. These four propositions, quote, in mundo non deter hiatus, non deter saltus, non deter calcis, non deter fatum, End quote. as well as all principles of transcendental origin, we could very easily exhibit in their proper order, that is, in conformity with the order of categories, and assign to each its proper place. But the already practiced reader will do this for himself, or discover the clue to such an arrangement. But the combined result of all is simply this, to understanding and the continuous connection of all phenomena, that is, the unity of conception with the understanding. For in the understanding alone is the unity of experience, in which all perceptions must have their assigned place possible. Whether the field of possibility be greater than that of reality, and whether the field of the latter be itself greater than that of necessity, are interesting enough questions and quite capable of synthetic solution, questions, however, which come under the jurisdiction of reason alone. For they are tantamount to asking whether all things as phenomena do without exception belong to the complex and connected whole of a single experience, of which every given perception is a part and which therefore cannot be conjoined with any other phenomenon, or whether my perceptions can belong to more than one possible experience. The understanding gives to experience, according to the subjective and formal conditions of sensibility as well as per a perception, the rules which alone make this experience possible. Other forms of intuition besides those of space and time, other forms of understanding besides the discursive forms of thought, or of cognition by means of conception, we can neither imagine nor make intelligible to ourselves. And even if we could, they would still not belong to experience, which is the only mode of cognition by which objects are presented to us. Whether our perceptions besides those which belong to the total of our possible experience, and consequently, whether some other sphere of matter exists, the understanding has no power to decide, its proper occupation being with the synthesis of that which is given. Moreover, the poverty of the usual arguments would go to prove the existence of a vast sphere of possibility, of which all that is real, parentheses, every object of experience, and parens, 
is but a small part, is very remarkable. Quote, all real is possible, end quote. From this follows naturally, according to the logical laws of conversion, the particular proposition, quote, some possible, is real, close quote. Now this seems to be equivalent to, quote, much is possible that is not real, end quote. No doubt it does seem as if we ought to consider the sum of the possible to be greater than that of the real, from the fact that something must be added to the former to constitute the latter. But this notion of adding to the possible is absurd, for that which is not in the sum of the possible, and consequently requires to be added to it, is manifestly impossible. In addition to accordance with the formal conditions of experience, the understanding requires a connection with some perception. But that which is connected with this perception is real, even although it is not immediately perceived. But that another series of phenomena, in complete coherence with that which is given in perception, consequently more than one all-embracing experience is possible, is an inference which cannot be concluded from the data given to us by experience, and still less without any data at all. That which is possible only under conditions which are themselves merely possible is not possible in any respect. And yet we can find no more certain ground on which to base the discussion of the question whether the sphere of possibility is wider than that of experience. I have merely mentioned these questions that in treating of the conception of the understanding there might be no omission of anything that, in the common opinion, belongs to them. In reality, however, the notion of absolute possibility, parentheses, possibility which is valid in every respect, close parens, is not a mere conception of the understanding, which can be employed empirically, but belongs to reason alone, which passes the bounds of all empirical use of the understanding. We have, therefore, contented ourselves with a merely critical remark, leaving the subject to be explained in the sequel. Before concluding this fourth section, and at the same time the system of all principles of pure understanding, it seems proper to mention the reasons which induced me to term the principles of modality postulates. This expression I do not here use in the sense which some more recent philosophers, contrary to its meaning with mathematicians, to whom the word properly belongs, attach to it, that of a proposition, namely, immediately certain, requiring neither deduction nor proof. For, if, in the case of synthetical propositions, however evident they may be, we accord to them without deduction, and merely on the strength of their own pretensions, unqualified belief, all critique of the understanding is entirely lost. And, as there is no want of bold pretensions, which the common belief, parens, though for philosopher this is no credential, and parens, does not reject, the understanding lies exposed to every delusion and conceit, without the power of refusing its assent to those assertions, which, though illegitimate, demand acceptance as veritable axioms. When, therefore, to the conception of a thing an a priori determination is synthetically added, such a proposition must obtain, if not proof, at least a deduction of the legitimacy of its assertion. The principles of modality are, however, not objectively synthetical, for the predicates of possibility, reality, and necessity do not in the least augment the conception of that of which they are affirmed, inasmuch as they contribute nothing to the representation of the object. But as they are nevertheless always synthetical, they are so merely subjectively. That is to say, they have a reflective power, and apply to the conception of a thing of which in other respects they affirm nothing, the faculty of cognition in which the conception originates and has its seat. So that if the conception merely agree with the formal conditions of experience, its object is called possible. If it is connection with perception, and determined thereby, the object is real. If it is determined according to conceptions by means of the connection of perceptions, the object is called necessary. The principles of modality therefore predicate of a conception nothing more than the procedure of the faculty of cognition which generated it. Now a postulate in mathematics is a practical proposition which contains nothing but the synthesis by which we present an object to ourselves, and produce the conception of it, for example, quote, with a given line to describe a circle upon a plane from a given point, end quote. And such a proposition does not admit of proof, because the procedure which it requires is exactly that by which alone it is possible to generate the conception of such a figure. 
With the same right, accordingly, can we postulate the principles of modality, because they do not augment the conception of a thing, but merely indicate the manner in which it is connected with the faculty of cognition. Footnote. When I think the reality of a thing, I do really think more than the possibility, but not in the thing, for that can never contain more in reality than was contained in its complete possibility. But while the notion of possibility is merely the notion of a position of thing in relation to the understanding, parens, its empirical use, and parens, reality is the conjunction of the thing with perception. End footnote. General Remark on the System of Principles it is very remarkable that we cannot perceive the possibility of a thing from the category alone, but must always have an intuition by which to make evident the objective reality of the pure conception of the understanding. Take, for example, the categories of relation. How, one, a thing can exist only as a subject and not as a mere determination of other things, that is, can be the substance. Or how, two, because something exists, some other thing must exist, consequently how a thing can be a cause. Or how, three, when several things exist, from the fact that one of these things exists, some consequence to the others follows, and reciprocally, and in this way, a community of substances can be possible, are questions whose solution cannot be obtained from mere conceptions. The very same is the case with the other categories. For example, how a thing can be of the same sort with many others, that is, can be a quantity, and so on. So long as we have not intuition, we cannot know whether we do really think an object by the categories, and where an object can be anywhere found to cohere with them, and thus the truth is established, that the categories are not in themselves cognitions, but mere forms of thought for the construction of cognitions from given intuitions. For the same reason, it is true that from categories alone, no synthetical proposition can be made. For example, quote, in every existence there is substance, end quote. That is, something that can exist only as a subject and not as a mere predicate, or, quote, everything is a quantity, end quote. To construct propositions such as these, we require something to enable us to go out beyond the given conception and connect another with it. For the same reason, the attempt to prove a synthetical proposition by means of a mere conceptions, for example, quote, everything that exists contingently has a cause, end quote, has never succeeded we could never get further than proving that, without this relation to conceptions, we could not conceive the existence of the contingent, that is, could not a priori through the understanding cognize the existence of such a thing. But it does not hence follow that this is also the condition of the possibility of the thing itself that is said to be contingent. If, accordingly, we look back to our proof of the principle of causality, we shall find that we were able to prove it is valid only of objects of possible experience, and indeed, only as itself the principle of the possibility of experience, consequently of the cognition of an object given an empirical intuition and not from mere conceptions. That, however, the proposition, quote, everything that is contingent must have a cause, end quote, is evident to every one merely from conceptions, is not to be denied. But in this case, the conception of the contingent is cogitated as involving not the category of modality, parens, as the non-existence of which can be conceived, close parens, but that of relation, parens, as that which can exist only as the consequence of something else, close parens. And so it is really an identical proposition, quote, that which can exist only as a consequence has a cause, end quote. In fact, when we have to give examples of contingent existence, we always refer to changes, and not merely to the possibility of conceiving the opposite. Footnote. We can easily conceive the non-existence of matter, but the ancients did not thence infer its contingency. But even the alternation of the existence and non-existence of a giving state in a thing in which all change consists, by no means proved the contingency of that state, the ground of proof being the reality of its opposite. For example, a body is in a state of rest after motion, but we cannot infer the contingency of the motion from the fact that the former is opposite to the latter, for this opposite is merely a logical and not a real opposite to the other. If we wish to demonstrate the contingency of motion, that we ought to prove is that, instead of the motion which took place in the preceding point of time, it was possible for the body to have been then in rest, not that it is afterwards in rest. For in this case, both opposites are perfectly consistent with each other. End footnote. But change is an event 
which as such is possible only through a cause, and considered per se, its non-existence is therefore possible, and we become cognizant of a contingency from the fact that it can exist only as the effect of a cause. Hence, if a thing is assumed to be contingent, it is an analytical proposition to say, it has a cause. But it is still more remarkable that, to understand the possibility of things according to the categories, and thus to demonstrate the objective reality of the latter, we require not merely intuitions, but external intuitions. If, for example, we take the pure conceptions of relation, we find that 1. For the purpose of presenting to the conception of substance something permanent in intuition corresponding thereto, and thus of demonstrating the objective reality of this conception, we require an intuition open parens, of matter, close parens, and space, because space alone is permanent and determines things as such, while time, and with it all that is in the internal sense, is in a state of continual flow. 2. In order to represent change as the intuition corresponding to the conception of causality, we require the representation of motion as change in space. In fact, it is through it alone that changes, the possibility of which no pure understanding can perceive are capable of being intuited. Change is the connection of determinations contradictorily opposed to each other in the existence of one and the same thing. Now, how is it possible that out of a given state one quite opposite to it and the same thing should follow? Reason without an example can not only not conceive, but cannot even make intelligible without intuition. And this intuition is the motion of a point in space, the existence of which, in different spaces, parens, as a consequence of opposite determinations, close parens, alone makes the intuition of change possible. For, in order to make even internal change cognitable, we require to represent time as the form of the internal sense, figuratively by a line, and the internal change by the drawing of that line, open parens, motion, close parens, and consequently are obliged to employ external intuition to be able to represent the successive existence of ourselves in different states. The proper ground of this fact is that all change to be perceived as change presupposes something permanent in intuition, while well, in the internal sense no permanent intuition is to be found. Lastly, the objective possibility of the category of community cannot be conceived by mere reason, and consequently its objective reality cannot be demonstrated without an intuition and that external in space. For how can we conceive the possibility of community, that is, when several substances exist, that some effect on the existence of the one follows from the existence of the other, and reciprocally, and therefore that, because something exists in the latter, something else must exist in the former, which cannot be understood from its own existence alone? For this is the very essence of community, which is inconceivable as a property of things which are perfectly isolated. Hence, Leibniz, in attributing to the substance of the world, as cogitated by the understanding alone, a community, required the mediating aid of a divinity. For, from their existence, such a property seemed to him with justice inconceivable. But we can very easily conceive the possibility of community, friends of substances as phenomena and friends, if we represent them to ourselves as in space, consequently in external intuition. For external intuition contains in itself a priori formal external relations as the conditions of the possibility of the real relations of action and reaction, and therefore of the possibility of community. With the same ease can it be demonstrated that the possibility of things as quantities, and consequently the objective reality of the category of quantity, can be grounded only in external intuition and that by its means alone is the notion of quantity appropriated by the internal sense. But I must avoid prolixity, and leave the task of illustrating this by examples to the reader's own reflection. The above remarks are of the greatest importance, not only for the confirmation of our previous confutation of idealism, but still more when the subject of self-cognition by mere internal consciousness and the determination of our own nature without the aid of external empirical intuitions is under discussion, for the indication of the grounds of the possibility of such a cognition. The result of the whole of this part of the analytic principles is therefore, quote, all principles of the pure understanding are nothing more than a priori principles of the possibility of experience, 
and to experience alone do all a priori synthetical propositions apply and relate. End quote. Indeed, their possibility itself rests entirely on this relation. End Critique of Pure Reason Section 16, read by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, April 2007.